Exploration geochemistry is more than a workflow. Focusing solely on looking at data statistically is missing the nuances of the data. It's important to have appreciation for the underlying chemistry, why elements are in an environment in the first place. It's crucial to consider why elements are there and how they're able to move, if at all. This is a very brief introduction to concepts to think about before even making your first plot. It's important for geoscientists to return to their academic roots when looking at geochemical data, considering both the environment that they're in and how the environment has changed since the mineral deposit has formed. With an understanding of how and why elements behave and move, geoscientists can then make a meaningful interpretation of geochemical data through the use of tools such as statistics. Key concepts that we're going to cover, how elements behave, element mobility, primary and secondary environments, and chemical and physical transport mechanisms. And as the geochemistry cat says, no, I'm not trying to poison you. Now finish your lead and jelly sandwich. The periodic table matters. Besides telling us that copper, gold, zinc, that they're elements, the behavior of elements in natural systems is governed by electronegativity, valence ionic radiance, and ionic potential, which is useful to understand and predict the characteristics of chemical bonds, element substitutions within mineral structures, and element mobility. I chose to use this image over a standard periodic table because it presents the naturally occurring charged species commonly encountered by geoscientists, as well as elemental forms, and it's organized by charge. Organized by charge yields an arrangement more conducive to recognizing geochemical trends and provides a framework for understanding the geochemistry better than the conventional table. The first topic I'm going to touch on is electron negativity, a word that you'll likely know but may not recall why it's important in the context of geochemistry. It's a useful concept for the following reasons. It's used to predict bonds between different elements, whereby ionic bonding has high electron negativity difference and covalent bonding minimizes the electron negativity difference. Physical and chemical properties, including hardness and cleavage, the compound depend on electron negativity. And the solubility in water is largely influenced by the nature of the bond, whereby ionic bonds are highly soluble in water and covalent bonds have low sol solubility in water. Following this, ionic radius is important mineralogically because the size of an ion is critical in establishing whether that ion fits into a particular site in a possible mineral structure. The table below is a great summary of ions that can substitute for different elements in a mineral structure. Ionic potential or charge divided by radius is important geochemically because much of the geochemical behavior depends on it. Ionic potential gives a sense of how strongly or weakly the ion will be electrostatically attracted to ions of opposite charge and to what extent the ion will repel each other, repel other ions of like charge. Some implications include how ionic potential affects igneous crystallization and how it controls the behavior of cations in solution. A great example of ionic potential in practice are Pearson's principles for hard soft acids and bases, which is applied uh, to metal complexation. There are appreciable number of ligands that can facilitate metal transport by hydrothermal fluids by forming metal complexes. But the important question for economic geologists are which of these ligands form stable complexes within the middle with the metals of interest and can play a role in their transport. Pearson proposed that in the case of competition among ions, hard acids or metals will bond preferentially with hard bases, with ligands, and they'll do so ionically, whereas soft acids will bond preferentially with soft bases and do so covalently. Knowledge of redox conditions, or equivalently oxygen fugacity and pH at which rock forms and evolves is important for interpreting the rock's history. pH is a measure of the acidity or alkalinity of a solution where pH is lowest in acidic solutions and highest in alkaline or basic solutions. EH is a measure of the redox or oxidation reduction state of the solutes in a solution. It is a measurement of electric potential and it's expressed in volts. Understanding these concepts is important because metal mobility is governed by the pH and EH of solutions 
and the oxidation state will determine the dominant ion or ions in solution. The diagram at the right shows a system at 300 degrees Celsius and 500 bar. It illustrates fields of stability where gold can be transported as specific complexes. For example, AuCl2 at a pH of less than 3 over a range of oxidation states, whereas AuHS2 negative between a pH of approximately 6 to 8.5 and, and more reducing conditions. And superimposed on this diagram are contours for solubility of gold and the conditions that need to be met for it to precipitate from solution and in what quantities. In the last slide, we talked a bit about logo uh, FO2 pH diagrams. It wasn't too scary, hopefully helpful. Here, we'll have a look at a real-world geochemical and mineralogical data with some theoretical diagrams built on simple thermodynamic calculations. The mineral class map at right shows a core box that has extensive amounts of buntingtonite. You can see this in purple. Buntingtonite is an ammoniated feldspar mineral. At closer inspection in this hyperspectral imaging data set, we can see there's a spatial correlation in this, uh, you know, this low sulfidation epithermal deposit between buntingtonite and gold. The same association between buntingtonite and gold was no noted by Harl of 2008. The author ran thermodynamic calculations which, which resulted in the graph seen at the bottom right. The conclusions were that the destabilization of an ammonia-rich gold complex is favored by alteration of the primary K-feldspar to ammonia-rich buntingtonite or illite due to the associated decrease in ammonia activity and hydrogen ion conception. And interestingly, it can be a more effective ligand than a bisulfite complex. So as you can see in the diagram uh, at, to, to the right, we have log AU ppm versus temperature. And at temperatures at about 150 or greater, the ability for the, uh, the ammonia uh, ion to transfer gold is significantly greater than it is for the bisulfide. Looking further uh, to the right, we have a, a log FO2 versus pH diagram where you can see that at pH is less than um, about six and a half and more slightly reducing to more oxidizing conditions that the ammonia uh, ion is also um, great at, uh, is better at transporting gold. Simply put, the diagram at left explains how extensive propylate was found in a porphyry copper system. The diagram at the left shows the temperature relative to MKCl over MHCl, which in turn shows mineral stability and fields for hydrothermal alteration types common in porphyry copper deposits. If you know your magma, your starting magma composition, and this diagram can help you understand the degree of cooling and amount of rock buffering in your system. For instance, in the image at the right, you can see rocks with a large amount of profilate in them. These rocks are also from about a kilometer depth. Referring back to the diagram at the left, you can observe that starting with a magma composition that has a lower K over uh, Na uh, composition, as you cool it, you pass the stability field of perophyllite. Switching gears, it's important to talk about what you're going to be tracking in your geochemical data set. Namely, are you looking at primary or secondary geochemistry? For primary ge geochemistry, we're looking at anomalies of deep-seated origin that may result from apparent local variation in the original composition of the Earth's crust defining distinctive geochemical province favorable for the occurrence of ore, impregnation of rocks by mineralizing fluids related to ore formation, or also dispersion of volatile elements transported in gaseous form. For secondary geochemistry, these are anomalies of surficial origin, residual material from the weathering of rocks and ores in place, uh, and also this could be material dispersed from the ore by gravity, moving water, or glacial ice. The diagram at right shows different types of media sampled during uh, exploration and baseline geochemical surveys of a mineral deposit. For example, the proximity of an undercover deposit can be reflected in zoned geochemical enrichments formed during the mineralization event, which would be primary dispersion, or as a result of post-mineral dispersion. Primary halos detected um, mainly by lithogeochemistry and secondary halos 
through groundwaters, soils, tills, stream sediments, etc. Following this, the next important considerations are whether the area you're exploring has been subjected to chemical transport or mechanical dispersion. Chemical transport is this, in the superficial environment results from percolating water carrying active agents that lead to the dissolution of rock forming minerals and the formation of new minerals or anamorphous or soluble phases controlled by climate, EH, pH, vegetation, microorganisms. It's also intimately linked with mechanical weathering. Mechanical dispersion, on the other hand, involves the physical reduction of grain size and the liberation of minerals from rock. The dump form a transport in arid, arctic, and mountainous regions, and it can increase the potential for chemical weathering because it's going to be increasing the surface area of the rock material. And there's a bunch of examples, frost action, thermal weathering, and low. Both types of dispersion will affect the geometry of pathfinder elements and may even create false anomalies. It's important to understand the dispersion mechanisms and element mobility in different climates. The illustration at right is an idealized version of a residual transported cover setting. There are a lot of considerations here to take into account for something that potentially even may look a little bit simple. So it's really important that you know your climate, your geomorphology, the tectonics even. It all adds to the greater picture of what you're gonna be seeing in your data. Commonly large data sets are, are acquired, but perhaps only a few elements are used, such as the ore elements and perhaps a few others. However, from many years of study, geochemists have found that there are elements that are associated with specific ore deposits that are useful to track when looking for new systems, and these are called pathfinder elements. The table at the right gives some good examples for different ore deposits. For example, epithermal gold silver, you could, in addition to seeing gold and silver, which hopefully you see, uh, would be uh, arsenic, but also potentially copper, lead, zinc, antimony, mercury, tungsten. Each deposit is going to be different, but by looking at your data, these are some good elements to have, um, have a start with um, looking at. The last topic I want to touch on here is the concept of background ranges and anomalies. Geochemical background. That's the normal element abundance level in an unmineralized earth material. It's more realistic to visualize this as a, as a range rather than an absolute value. Um, but I'm gonna say that it's really important to gather information about each rock's background val value in the area of interest that you're working in. An anomaly is any departure from the normal ranges of, of, of the earth material, positive or negative. And this can vary depending on where you are. Uh, but in general, you know, a basalt is a basalt is a basalt. Um, the concept of knowing your background is really important because 500 ppm of a pathfinder element in a basalt, for instance, that could not be significant. Whereas 150 ppm of that same element in the same district in a sedimentary rock is. So it's so important to know your rocks. The figure at the right over here just illustrates this idea of what background is and what, um, what anomalies are. It can be positive or negative. This has been a very brief review of some fundamentals to consider before tackling your data set. How and why are these elements here? Is my anomaly real? These are some fundamental questions that I hope now you'll be asking.